Calvary Chapel doing? All right, let's worship God. Those of you that are live streaming, hopefully, we've been having a little bit of difficulty. But uh, if you're there, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. And for all of you that made it here, praise the Lord. Amen. Father, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you for this time of worship. And we're thankful, uh, very thankful, Lord. As we celebrate Thanksgiving tomorrow, uh, I pray, Lord, just for the multiplied uh, gatherings that will be taking place and family and friends and brothers and sisters just coming together. And we just pray, God, that you would just um, bless the times that are had and, Lord, just cause the fellowship to be rich and deep and, Lord, just um, just beneficial, you know, in so many ways. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And we ask, God, that you would just provide uh, the food and, and just the blessing upon it. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you would just even now prepare our hearts, Lord, for what you have prepared for us. And, uh, Lord, we ask, God, that for those that are struggling, Lord, uh, in our midst and in our fellowship. We ask God for just your grace and mercy. And we ask God for your provision and just your touch upon those lives, Lord. We thank you for how good you are to us, how you have blessed us, Lord, in so many ways. We ask that you would just bless us one more time, Lord, with your word and with this time of praise. And we ask it in your precious name. And everyone said. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquered the grave. You freed every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You freed every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Well, hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you. I've done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You freed every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. You have done great things. You have done great things. 
Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good and his mercy forever endures. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. mercy forever and do well God is the Lord he has given us life he has offered for us a sacrifice he is my God and I God, and I will exalt Him. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good and His mercy forever and God is the Lord. He has given us life, He has offered for us a sacrifice. He is my God, and I will praise Him. He is my God, and I will exalt thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, He is good and His mercy forever and do, He is good and His mercy forever and do, He is good and His mercy forever and do. In case you haven't noticed what the theme is, it's giving thanks, right? Okay, I just want to make sure you guys caught on to that. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord call upon his name call upon his name make known his deeds and all his people call upon his name call upon his name oh give thanks oh Give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Call upon his name. Call upon his name, call upon his name, oh give thanks, oh give thanks, oh give thanks unto the Lord.
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ thanks 
We need you desperately, Lord. And Lord, we know and acknowledge that we have to get out of the way. God, we have to be emptied before you can fill us, Lord. And God, we ask that you'd forgive us for all the times that we exert ourselves and, um, and, and amplify our own worth, Lord, when you are the one who is worthy of all praise and honor and glory. God, we lift you up. You are the king of all kings. You are great and mighty and holy and good and righteous. And we bow at your throne, Lord. We come here, Lord, just so thankful for all that you've given us, that you've um, given us the guarantee, your Holy Spirit, to seal us until the day that we get our new bodies and we can worship you as you deserve, Lord. God, we thank you for this time and this chance to worship you here and now and to have your presence in this room, God. What a privilege. Lord, go before us, around us, fill us, use us. We're yours, and we're just so, so thankful for all that you give us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. My voice didn't fail me. I know, that's good. And the and the then the live stream. It's all working. It's working steady. Crazy. I don't know. I don't understand it. Okay, hello everybody. Hi. <laughs> you got your cast off. Whoa, whoa, don't. You're going to get your cast on again. <laughs> okay. Okay, welcome everybody to Concord. Is that what that's what the rock stars do? They go, hey, Concord. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. We're, at, we're here for another Wednesday, and I just hate to break up the fellowship because everybody's talking and everything else, and so that's good. Um, one thing we need to do is uh, pray for Tom, Tom Turkey, because there's going to be about a million of them killed tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at everybody saying, oh, who's Tom? Tom, Tom? <laughs> anyway, I thought it'd be a little humor. No, I noticed all the songs were all about thankful, you know, thank and all that. So that was nice how, how that worked out. It wasn't a coincidence, I guess. It was planned. <laughs> anyway, tonight, um, Pastor's going to be teaching us on Exodus chapter 3. And... See how many verses are there's 22 verses, so I'll just start reading them in, until he gets ready. Okay, and it's, it's about Moses and the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mount of God, the mountain of God. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, Now I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And then he said, Do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place you are where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from, the, from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perserites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. A lot of sites there. Now, therefore, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I also have seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that he may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay, I'll stop there. Let's pray for the service, the rest of the service. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have given us. Thank you that we could, that we could come to church and freely and, and still this is a land that we could worship you. And we do praise you and love you. Please anoint the pastor tonight as he comes and teaches us from your word. And we love you, we love your word, and we love our pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Exodus chapter 3. Moses, we know, in the last chapter, was born. Born to Amram and Jochebed. Hidden for three months because of the decree to kill all the male Hebrew children and place them, or by placing them into the Nile River. But when she couldn't hide Moses any longer, she built an ark and she put pitch in it, waterproofed it, and she put Moses in the basket and placed him in the water. And the reason why was that she was a woman of vision. For she, verse 2 tells us, saw that her son was a goodly child. And because she was a woman also of the word, because really nothing else could explain her decision to place her son in the very river in which all the other male babies his age were being drowned. But I think she also knew the story of Noah. The Hebrew word translated ark in verse 3 used only one other place in Scripture in reference to Noah. And so she lined it with pitch. So likewise with us. Ask God to give you a vision for your child, for your grandchild. And immerse yourself in the word. Believe in it. Act on faith in it. And so Miriam, Moses' sister, watched over her baby brother. And she watched the daughter of Pharaoh, Thermutus, pick him out of the water. And she has compassion on him. And Miriam puts herself and places herself in a position with the Pharaoh's daughter and unbeknownst to her, offers to her, her mom, to nurse the baby. And she gets paid for it as well. What a great story. It pays to believe the Bible, and it pays to have a vision. Just ask Jacobed. 
And it's always amazing to me how God is able to work even in adverse circumstances. How he's able to work his will and his purposes. And we see the tie-in with the New Testament where it says all things work together for good to those that love God. And so as a result of this arrangement, Moses grew. And he was not only, you know, healthy physically, intellectually, though he had been trained and really well-versed in the way of the Egyptians. And back in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, it says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. He had it going on. But then came that point where he took out the Egyptian in verses 11 through 15. Moses, after that event, flees to a place called Midian. But the event, he saw a Hebrew and an Egyptian, an Egyptian taking advantage or beating on the Hebrew. And so Moses goes down to step in and break up the fight between the two of them. And he ends up killing the Egyptian. Remember looking this way and looking that way, seeing no one, but he didn't look up to hear what God had to say about it. For God was watching. And in verse 13, it says, And he went, or when he went out the second day, behold, there were two Hebrew men this time fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? And then he said, verse 14, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And so Moses feared, and he said, Surely this thing is known. Now we saw that Moses was a type of Christ, rejected by them the first time that he came. During the time of his rejection, he marries a Gentile bride, but when he came back with his Gentile bride, they received him on that second return. And he became the deliverer of God's people. But in this first time, he's a little bit premature. And it is not by the Spirit, but it's by Moses' own power and might. He's doing it the way that he's been taught by the Egyptians. And so Moses, as a result, he flees to the land of Midian. He was the right guy in the right place, but doing things the wrong way. And how often do we find ourselves in that same situation. And I love the mercy and the grace of God. Coming with wisdom, the power and the wealth of Egypt is what his methodology or modus operandi was. But that's not what God wanted him to do. Verses 16 through 22 tells us that Moses got married to a daughter of Jethro by the name of Zephora. And they had a son by the name of Gershom. And then in verses 23 through 25, Israel cries out for help. And it tells us then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. In verse 1 of chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. So he marries Zephorah and he becomes a herdsman for his father-in-law. And he's out there in the desert tending to the flock. Jethro, who is actually the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert. It seems to me that as you look through the scripture, there's something about the desert and the way that the Lord uses it to prepare the hearts of his servants. Elijah was a man of the desert. John the Baptist grew up in the desert regions of the Dead Sea down in southern Israel. And Paul, we know, spent three years following his conversion in the deserts of Arabia. John the Revelator was banished to the desert island of Patmos. Like you, I'm sure, I have gone through those desert times, those times when the Lord separates you and he puts you out what seemingly is a dry season. A time where you just feel so just bent and broken and, and beaten down. But I've come to understand something about 
as the years have gone by what those desert times are kind of about. That they are imperative. If I'm and if you are to be the one who is not dependent on your feelings, not dependent on your emotions, those desert seasons are essential. They're imperative. We, we need them desperately in our lives that we are not swept up into the feelings and into the emotions. And so those desert seasons are essential for us to come to a place where we can say, Lord, you promised that you would be with me. You know, those times when you, things just are not working out, where, you know, you've taken hits, you know, whether it's family members or whether it's, I mean, we've all been there and we've all gone through that. And it, it's, it's devastating at the time. And yet the Lord uses those things. And that's where his promises come in very, very useful, but almost so necessary for us in our life, in our walk. Because his promise to us is that he would never leave us, no matter how dry the times might be or how solitary the setting may be. You know, we're just kind of all alone. There's no one there. And that's, I think, one of the things that we, is the biggest lessons that we have to learn is to learn how to not depend on people rather than depending on the Lord. Because I don't know, you know, about you, but I, I think the first place that we want to go is where? Well, if you have a wife, you want to go to your wife to get solace there. And if she looks at you and says, grow up, you big baby, you know, you, you're in trouble with that avenue. But there's others that, you know, are out there that you can ask, you can talk to. And it seems like that's the first place that you go. And yet, through those dry times, through those desert times, the Lord is wanting and desiring for us to be dependent on Him. The Lord is desiring for us to go to Him first rather than going to everybody else and seeking what their opinions might be or looking for something that is something that we would like to hear or is pleasing to our ears or tickling to our ears. We do that. We keep going from one person to the next person to the next person until we hear the news or the direction or the instruction that the, you, we want to hear. You know, it's like the guy, I, I want to move to Idaho. And he goes to his dad and his dad says, son, it's not a good idea because of this, this, and this. And he goes to this, you know, his mom and his mom says, no, honey, you, you shouldn't go to Idaho. And, and on down the line until he finally finds, you know, the, the, the uh, dishwasher at the restaurant he works at who just has been working there for less than a week and he goes, what do you think? you think I should move to Idaho? He goes, yeah, go for it. I mean, it's, it's like we, we're waiting for that thing, that one person, that one that would give us a confirmation that we want to hear. But God's saying, guys, wait a minute. These dry seasons, these dry times, they're there so that you can sort things through, that you can understand what it means to be dependent upon me. And then that solitary time, understanding what it is that I'm seeking to accomplish in your life. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that your word, the Lord's word has been given. And as it's been given, he's teaching us in those times how to stand upon it rather than sinking into our own emotions, to sinking into our own feelings. It's like, I don't, I don't feel it. I don't feel like doing that. And it's like, it's not my feelings, guys. Fact, faith, and feelings. Fact, you know, leads the way. Feelings are last. Actually, faith leads the way. But we know we need to keep those things straight. And so it's just a great opportunity, you know, here for growth to take place within Moses. And he's out there in the backside. And over the years, like I said, I, I've seen a lot of talented people in all kinds of different ministries fall away because their emotions, rather than the word, dictated their walk. And so you need to really ask yourself the question, what is it that is dictating your walk? You know, what is it? Is it the word of God or is it your emotions? Is there a fickleness, you know, about you? Because we all know what emotions do, Right? They go up and they go down. They're like a roller coaster. And, you know, you're sitting there wondering what you feel like and, 
trying to get in touch with yourself rather than just depending on God and depending upon his word and looking to him. Let those things of the word of God dictate your walk because those emotions will just leave you hanging. You know, emotions are affected by how your job is going or how, you know, your family is doing or how much pizza you had the previous evening. It can be affected by the slightest thing, but because God wants us to be stable, because he wants us to be rock solid, on, planted on that foundation, anchored in a way that we can't be tossed and turned and, and thrown aside. He wants us to walk by faith, not by feelings. And because of that, he'll put us into the desert place where we, like Moses, must learn to be content. We've got to learn to be content and say, Lord, You've given me the promise of your word. That's all I need. I don't need a consensus. I don't need to keep going until I find someone that's going to agree with my opinion. Lord, the promise of your word, that you'll guide me, that you'll direct me, that, Lord, you'll take care of me. You know, we can look at our resources and think, oh, man, I don't know if we're going to make it. It's going to be nip and tuck. It's going to be, oh, you know, and you, you, you kind of wonder, you know, or maybe you've never been in that position. Maybe you have a steady, rock-solid income coming in. And yet, you know, there's a time that the Lord oftentimes will allow you to go through hardships. If that time comes, you know, again, where are you going to go? Who are you going to go to? You know, hopefully it would be to depend upon Him. And so Moses is there in that position. He's there in that place. He's tending to his father-in-law's sheep in the very back portion of the desert. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now Horeb, this mountain is also known as, by another name actually, it's the mountain called Mount Sinai. And that's the place where Moses well received the Ten Commandments according to Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 2. And so Moses, once a most respected man, now a most rejected man, he had lagged in his time, or logged in his time, I should say, in, in the desert. And the work has taken root in him, in his life. It's being cultivated, it's being developed. God is doing just a, a great work, you know, in Moses. And when you look at the time frame, Man, you can see this is a lifetime work. He lived to 120 years of age and 40, if you divided it basically up, the first 40 years was under the tutelage and, and the growth that he was receiving there in Egypt. The next 40 years was out in the desert herding sheep. And then the last 40 years was when God really worked in his life and through his life in a very powerful way in order to set the uh, children of Israel free from the Egyptians and the slavery that they were in bondage to. And so here this man that was most respected, now most rejected, logging his time, and God is just molding him and shaping him. And God is about to move him and make him self-known to Moses in the most amazing way. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire, from the midst of the bush. And I love the fact that when God wants to speak and when he wanted to speak to Moses, that he didn't use like a big, towering, strong oak tree. He didn't use a stately pine tree. He didn't even use a fragrant cedar tree. What did he use? A garden variety bush. And that's so like me, so like you, I'm sure, as well. The angel of the Lord, that that phrase is unique in the Old Testament, but don't confuse the word angel with that created race of beings we call angels. The word angel itself simply means messenger. And so this person is the messenger of Yahweh. And we believe that this is the person of Jesus Christ, a theophany, an Old Testament appearance. And this is how Jesus appears in the Old Testament before he has taken on that human flesh as a baby in Bethlehem. This is how he would come. Now, 
Apart from Jesus, without a doubt, the greatest leader in the world history would have to be that man who led a congregation of three million people for 40 years across the desert from Egypt to the borders of the promised land. That's a task. That would have been a job. And in fact, it almost killed him until Jethro came to Moses. His father-in-law came to Moses, said, Moses, you're wearing yourself out. You've got to do something. You've got to set up leaders over groups of 10 and 20 and so on and so forth in order to rule the people because Moses was trying to judge all the cases of all three million of the people and it was wearing him completely out. And yet his leadership undoubtedly was amazing as God led him, as God directed him, and as God used him as this, in this position of caring for the flock of Israel during that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Scripture tells us that his sight wasn't dimmed. His strength wasn't diminished. Even at the point when he died at 120 years of age. That's amazing to me. Sight not dimmed, strength not diminished. But the life of this remarkable man, it can be, as I said, divided into four or three 40-year segments. And in that first 40 years, Moses became somebody. God rescued him out of the Nile River. He was adopted by Ramses II. He was educated by the best scholars in Egypt. He was a military hero. And he was in line to become the next pharaoh of the Egyptian empire. But the next 40 years, however, Moses was a nobody. For at the age of 40, after killing an Egyptian taskmaster, he fled for his life to the desert. And then in our text tonight, we see God reaching out to Moses, causing his final 40 years to be spent as a model for everyone, everyone to look at, everyone to live by. And I love the fact that when he started, or when he wanted to bring Moses to the place of service and of ministry, the Lord uses a plain old, plain old, plain old bush, just like me, just like you. And what that tells me is, first of all, Number one, that the Lord can use me and the Lord can use you. And not only that, he desires to use you guys. Again, to speak to Moses. You know, I, I, I can't imagine not using something mighty that represents God, like a huge oak tree, strong, sturdy. Or a majestic pine tree, you know, really tall and just like a skyscraper. But he didn't use any of those, not even a cedar with a sweet-smelling fragrance. Not one of those did he use. He used a bush. The Hebrew word translated bush is sina, and literally it refers to a thorny bush. Now, according to botanists, thorns are basically aborted branches, that is, they should have been branches, but they just didn't get that far. And so here's this bush. It's a very common thing. It's, a, it's, it's very common. It's prickly. And it even, it, it, it attempts, you know, it's times of, of growing branches are just so weak that they don't develop. They don't really, really amount to anything except a sharp, sharp point. And again, it's just like me just like you. But you see, the Lord, that, that's exactly what he loves to use, is bushes, like you and like me. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26? For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God, and I love that, those but God statements because God changes everything all around, especially when we look at it and we go like, well, where do I fit in and all that? I don't see my place. And then all of a sudden you see but God. 
has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Anybody fall into that category? And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen those things and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Not going to be able to do it. God chooses those that are bushes. Those who are bush league, if you would. Those who feel bushed. Because when he uses a bush, all the glory goes to him. It doesn't go to that majestic pine. It doesn't go to that big, strong, and sturdy oak. It doesn't go to that cedar, that fragrant, sweet cedar tree. Now it goes to God. All the glory goes to him as where it should go. Paganini, who was a great violinist of a generation ago, he did something amazing when in a Viennese concert hall one evening, he walked onto the stage, violin in hand, and he picked it up and he began to play and he, as he played, broke a string. He followed that by breaking a second string. And then he broke a third string which only left one string remaining. Paganini nestled the violin under his chin and for a solid, solid 18 minutes he played magnificently. As the crowd rose to its feet in ovation, Paganini said, one string in Paganini. And realizing they had heard a true master, the crowd just stood and gave an ovation after ovation. Now, you or I, we might feel like we only have one string. You might even feel like you're strung out, strung along, or a third string in the crowd. But the reality is the Lord loves to use that which is what? Not the strong, not the powerful, not the mighty. God delights in using the weak, the unimportant, the unimpressive because then he, the master musician, he receives the ovation. He receives the glory. He receives the adoration, which is what he desires from us. Now, some would say, well, why does God reserve all the glory for himself? Because, guys, he knows that if he shares his glory with you, with me, if people look up to you, if they lean on me, become impressed with us, every one of us will ultimately, ultimately disappoint them. And so for this reason, God says, I alone will receive glory because I alone will never disappoint anyone who looks to me, who trusts in me, and who leans on me. Only God is solid and stable enough to see us through day after day after decade and throughout eternity. And so God uses bushes. It's a good thing. We should have t-shirts made up, bush for Jesus or something. But he uses those one string violins and he uses common people like you and like me in order that he alone receives the praise. And so the Lord can use me. And secondly, the Lord is with me. He's with you. So here's Moses. He's on the backside of the desert day after week after month after year. And decades go by. And then something happens. Among the many bushes in the wilderness, one burns brightly without being consumed. And he can't for the life of him figure it out. But it causes Moses to eventually realize that the Lord was with him. That really, truly, the Lord was with him. Now think about it. Where is God tonight? 
Where is God? I'll tell you where he is. He's in the bush sitting next to you. That prickly person, you ask? Yeah. God is in that person sitting next to you. He's in the person that you're married to. He's in the person that you work with. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Lord surely can't speak through my husband. (laughs) Our kids, the Lord surely can't speak through my parents or my boss. They're not even on fire. Oh, but there's what you need to see. That is the bush. The bush, guys, the bush was not on fire. The fire was in the bush. The bush wasn't on fire. The fire was in the bush. You might think that people around you aren't on fire. And that may be true, but if they're believers, the fire is in them. Maybe it's just a little coal. Maybe it needs to be stirred up. Maybe it needs to be, you know, bellowed or something. But it still is in that person. Although Jesus did mighty works in Capernaum, there were those who scoffed at him and said, we know him. We know who this guy is. You know, we just not a little kid that was playing all the time in the street and, you know, was kicking the, this, the, not a can, but, you know, kicking things around, you know. We know this kid. We know this kid. And he'd done mighty works in Capernaum, but they looked at him and said, he's just a son of of a carpenter. Aren't his brothers and sisters, I mean, if he's so high and mighty, high pollutant, whatever, then what are his brothers and sisters doing here? Yeah, they were among them. And as they looked at him, they thought that he was just, just the son of a carpenter, failing to realize that he was son of a creator. The creator he was the son of. In Mark's gospel, chapter 6, the disciples were toiling. They were working and the waves were mounting. The wind was howling. And in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, they look out on the Sea of Galilee and there's someone walking towards them. Now, you got to understand that there was a legend of that day that said that right before a group of fishermen had drowned, they saw a spirit coming towards them. No wonder their fear was rising. They were thinking it's a ghost. That is until Jesus got close enough and said, be of good cheer, it is I. As the two disciples walked towards Emmaus, they were joined by one who was you know, asking questions and had asked them why they were so sad. And incredulously, they looked at him and go, who, who, what planet did you come from? Are you a stranger here or, or what? Luke 24. But they hadn't yet recognized that it was Jesus himself who was walking beside them. Then finding the tomb empty that Easter morning, Mary Magdalene wept. Seeing a man she supposed to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have moved the body, tell me where are you taking him? Wanting and desiring to tend to the body. But all of a sudden the gardener answered and spoke her name, Mary. And immediately she recognized who the man was. John chapter 20. And so Jesus dwells with us in the carpenter's son, in those we think that we know. He speaks to us through people that may frighten us as they dare to rattle the bars of our beliefs. 
But our Lord, he has a way of reaching out through strangers that walk alongside of us. He speaks to us through those that are gardeners, through those that are plumbers, or those that work beside us, those that work for us. Oh, they may also not be on fire, but the fire is in them. And the Lord can use them as easily and as powerfully and surprisingly as he can use a very common everyday bush like you and I. God has that ability. Bushes burning in the desert are common. Lightning strikes, bolts of lightning, they ignite. Nomads even used to burn them to keep warm at night. Therefore, assuming lightning had struck the bush or it, that it was simply the remnant of a, of a campfire, Moses could have easily walked right on by that night. That's nothing. But he didn't. He stopped long enough to notice that this bush was a little bit different than the other bushes. This bush's name, first name was George. No. It was different. What? It was not being consumed. You know, the problem with too many of us, too much of the time, is that we don't want to stop long enough to take the time and to ponder those bushes that God has placed in our life and around us. We are usually in such a hurry that we don't take time to say, maybe, maybe, just maybe my dad has the word of the Lord for me today. Maybe this stranger in my life is being used to speak to me in some way. Or maybe my son has a word from the Lord for me this morning. Maybe God laid something on his heart that I need to really hear and need to receive from him. And I got to tell you, I'm convinced that we miss so many things that the Lord would say to us or use for directing us in the directions that he would give. Maybe perhaps even blessings that he would bestow because we, in a hurry, in our hastiness, walked right by. <coughs> but the deal is this. The Lord wants to guide. The Lord wants to direct. And he wants to bless you. He wants to guide you in those times that you're feeling like, what am I supposed to do? Do I go this direction? Do I go that direction? Do I make this decision? Do I make that decision? That comes up all the time, guys. We need to be those that seek the Lord for those decisions. Just to ensure and to make sure that we're abiding with the plan of God that he has for our life. Because see, he has a plan for each and every one of us. And he's seeking to carry out that plan in our lives. Lord, help us not to miss the things that the Lord would say to us, the directions that he would give to us, and the blessings that he would bestow upon us. He wants to guide you and direct you and bless you if you'll simply take the time to stop and check out the bush that is sitting right next to you. May we be those who have eyes that see, ears that hear, and feet that stop in order that we might receive illumination, that we might receive instruction and warmth from the bushes that surround us, that God has placed into our life, because there's a lot of them there. Verse 2 goes on to say, So he looked and he beheld. The bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and I will see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So it's not just a burning bush, but the bush continues to burn 
and not be burned up. Now, would Moses have turned aside to study this situation, to contemplate it, this interesting phenomena of a bush burning but not being consumed? Would he have stopped and pondered this if he was in the city? Would he have done it if he was engaged in lots of activity? Guys, if he was in the palace of Pharaoh as he was for the previous 40 years, I don't think he would have done that. I don't think he would have investigated. Same thing with us. Because you see, the Lord places me, he places you, us, at times, he'll place us in those desert regions. And it doesn't mean he takes you out to the Mojave Desert or something like that. Maybe there's something, there's something in your life that is to you that desert region. That is to you that place where he's taking you. On the back side of, of, of the country, of the, in the farthest part away in, in the desert. And he's got you out there seeking to do a work in you. Seeking to reveal to you things that you need to be aware of. And so here he is. And I see myself, as I said, being placed in that desert region because it is only then, it's only at that time that we have eyes to hear and ears to see or ears to hear and eyes to see the things that he desires to tell me. When we're really focused, whereas in the busyness and the hustle, we might perhaps miss it. We're in that place of being able to receive you know, from him. Being able to, to hear that still, small voice. You know, go, I mean, and even that's not far enough, but go up to Mount Diablo sometime. If you got a day off, go up during the day when there's not much traffic up there. Find a quiet place. You know, we've talked about it all the time. Quiet heart, quiet place, and a quiet time. Of just waiting, listening. Waiting for the Lord to give to us that instruction. Give to us that direction. And we're not disrupted. We're not interfered with. We're not in a position where there's humming and activity and hecticness. Because I believe that many of us and many of the key indicators that God sends our way, we end up missing. And so if you're in a desert, guys, a desert place, whatever that is to you, if you're in a desert kind of a job, maybe it's not just the one place that you've taken a trip to. You know, maybe it's, it's the circumstances of your life at that particular time, that there's turmoil, that there's chaos, that there's, there's tension within a family circle or within a relationship or there's problems at work and you're struggling with it and you're just going, what do I do? These are the things that God wants to be involved in in your life. These are the things that he wants you to come and to pay attention to what he's instructing you, what he's directing you, and what he's revealing to you in terms of his plan, his purpose, and not only that, his desire for you to be in harmony with him. And if you were more active or more engaged or more fulfilled, you would miss those times. You would miss those bits of instruction that he would have for you. And so verse 4, when the Lord saw that he did, and this is important too, if you can underline this, if you've got a paper Bible. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, what does that tell you? And well, it tells me that the Lord is watching. He's looking, he's wanting to see what your response is going to be, what your reaction is going to be. How is he going to handle this? It's almost like, in a way, the Lord's fishing. He's throwing the bait out there. He's going, come on, come on. I really want to do this work in you. I really, I want to, I want to see you progress. I want to see you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. I want to see that. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, then God called to him from the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. 
And he said, here I am. Now, based upon this little revelation here, we might wonder, hey, what's the deal, man? Why, why don't I hear from the Lord more often, right? Come on. Well, it could be that you're buzzing about too much and he can't catch up with you. You've you're got too much activity going on. You're just busy. You're busy, 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 busy. It could be that things are going too smoothly. It could be that the Lord wants us to log in some desert times quite regularly. Times when things seem lonely and dry. Could be any one of those things. But I tell you what, when, when did the Lord respond? It was only when Moses turned to see the burning bush that God called his name. Didn't do it before. He could have. He could have, re- he, he could have reached out. No. Moses, what is this? Wow. It's a bush that burns, but it's not consumed. And when God, remember, he looked this way and he looked this way but he didn't look this way. Now things are changing. And he looks this way and he's focused on that. And then God approaches and he looks this way. And he's hearing from the Lord. And it's all the difference in the world. But it was only when Moses turned to see the burning bush that God called his name. And so say there's a burning bush in your desert. Say, first of all, you have a desert. That place, and it doesn't mean it has to physically look like a desert. Maybe it's your job location. Maybe it's your home. Maybe it's a number of things. And things are just going crazy. And you're looking for that quiet time, quiet place with a quiet heart. It seems so lonely and so dry, barren, if you would. Well, understand that first of all, when the Lord has you there, don't get all bummed out. Don't get all hurt. Don't go, why me? Don't begin to wonder if God even loves you anymore because he loves you. He said he loved you. He'd never leave you or forsake you. He has an everlasting love for us. But there you are in that desert place. Know, know that God is going to use that in your life. And look for the way, look for the burning bush, whatever that becomes, whatever that that is for you, that thing that reaches out to you, that thing that grabs a hold of you. Maybe it's a message. Maybe maybe it's a radio talk show that the person just says something that's profound to you in terms of the word of God as it relates to your life. Whatever it is. Look for that. Look for that burning bush. And as you find it, you look to it as Moses did. You turn and you look to that burning bush. For it's at that point that we see here God called his name. And so when the Lord sees that you're not in that automatic pilot mode, that you're not running here and running there and everywhere, but that you have quieted yourself and you are in a place where you're curious about what he might say to you. Guys, know this. He will call your name as well. So what did he say? Verse 5. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. God said, you're in a special spot, Moses. You are in my presence. Whoa. Holy in the Hebrew there means holiness, sacredness, separateness. We think of being holy as being clean and pure. There's something that is different about this place. 
and he instructs Moses, take your sandals off. Now, this might be done as a sign of respect. Some cultures teach today people to take their shoes off when you enter the house. Mom wants to keep the carpet clean. But this ground, this ground is clean because of God's presence. It might mean that God didn't want something dirty or something man-made like sandals to come between this holy ground and Moses. God doesn't mind Moses' bare feet. He just doesn't want the sandals. Moreover, verse 6, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Even in identifying himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the Trinity is seen therein. And Moses, verse 6, hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. There in God's presence, Moses is acutely aware of his inadequacies very quickly. His fleshly tendencies pop up. His unworthiness, he understands. And he feels that he's in a bad position. Centuries later, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5 and Peter, Luke chapter 5 verse 8 would be two others who would come really to the same conclusion. I'm unworthy unworthy, inadequate. But what about going barefoot? Moses was asked to take his shoes off because he was on holy ground. I, I kind of wonder if I really have an idea, if you have an idea, if you even have thought about the idea of what holiness looks like. What does holiness look like? A pastor was asked to dinner by one of his parishioners who he knew was not a great housekeeper. So when he sat down at the table, he noticed that the dishes were probably the dirtiest that he'd ever seen in his life. Were these dishes ever washed? He asked his hostess, running his finger over the grit and the grime. And she replied, they're as clean as soap and water could get them. Well, he felt a little bit apprehensive, but he blessed the food anyways, and he started eating, and it was delicious, and he said so, despite the dirty dishes. Well, when the dinner was over, the hostess took the dishes outside, set them on the porch, and yelled, come here, soap, come here, water. She had two dogs named Soap and Water. I look at my life and kind of think that I must be okay because my dishes are about as clean as soap and water can get them. Okay? But is my life really that even that clean? We live in a pretty filthy world, don't we? And it's hard to get through this life without getting dirty. And after a while, we get kind of comfortable with our filth. I wonder if we'd recognize a clean plate if we saw one. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8. He says in verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Sanctification is the process of becoming more holy, more clean. As I said, our world's filled with garbage. And it's very easy to become dirty and tainted. He goes on in verse 4. He says that for what? That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel with sanctification and honor. Your vessel is your body. It's learning to keep your plate clean, guys. Verse 5. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in the matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such things, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, 
He who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has given to us his Holy Spirit. Some people don't want to hear about keeping their plate clean. But the problem isn't with people. Your problem is with God. God has put his Holy Spirit inside of you. And the Holy Spirit wants to make you more holy. The Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. If Moses was asked to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground that was made holy by God's presence, then what does that say about us? We're not standing on holy ground, guys. Guess what? We are holy ground. As the Spirit of God dwells in you. Maybe we all should go barefoot no matter where we go. But you see, taking your shoes off today doesn't mean the same thing for us as it did for Moses. Perhaps there are things we can remove from our life. What, what sandals do you have that God would say, get rid of them, take them off, get them out of here. They have no place. They do not belong. What would God convict you of in your life that would be the equivalent of those sandals? And are, are there things in your life that are messing with God's purity in your life. Well, we're almost done. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up from that land to a good and large land. To a land flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Termites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Man, so eager was Moses to be used 40 years earlier that he went out in his own strength and he killed an Egyptian taskmaster that was beating on one of his Jewish brothers. Whole different story now, though. As he has matured, as he's growing in that desert region, which happens, by the way, much growth. Just like I said, look at Paul, look at John, look at those that spend any length of time in the desert, and you'll find out, and when again, whatever that desert is to you, but you will spend time in there, God will use that in your life to refine, to mold, and to shape you. But you look at Moses Gung-ho initially, but not so much anymore. For he's matured and he's growing. And in the days of his dryness and boredom, humility has replaced impetuosity in the life of Moses. He's no longer impetuous. And I imagine probably up until this point, Moses is thinking, <clears throat> well, God, that's nice that you're concerned about helping these people. That's a great thing. That's a good thing. I'm, I'm glad somebody wants to do that. But why are you telling me this? And then God tells Moses that he is the one who will deliver the people from Egypt. He's the one that God will use. He is the one that God will work through. And so immediately in verses 11 and 12, Moses will throw up his first objection. We'll come into that next week. But what a story of this man who so surrendered and ends up being surrendered to God. Let's pray, guys. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, for just 
relaying to us, Father, the story of Moses. And Lord, just the way that, Father, you were so faithful, Lord, to do a work in him. Father, by trial, by dryness, Lord, by, in a sense, losing everything that he had acquired in Egypt, Lord, and being really placed in a dry, dry land. And I have to think, Lord, whatever it is in our lives that, Lord, you would like to accomplish that perhaps you haven't been able to because of the busyness and the bluster of everything that's going on around us in those locations that really lend themselves to that busyness. That, Father, you would reveal to us what is the equivalent in our life of that desert place. Maybe it's a park down the way from our house. Maybe it's a hike up Mount Diablo or Castle Rock or maybe it's a drive a little bit further away. But Lord, we would ask that, Father, you would just make that clear to us and reveal that, that plan to us. That we wouldn't be so busy doing stuff and doing, doing, doing so as to miss your direction, to miss your instruction to miss the blessings that, Lord, you want and desire to pour out upon our lives. Father, let it be the prayer of each person here tonight. Lord, I want to know. I need to know, Lord. Father, lead me, direct me to that place that you want me to be where I can see that fire in that bush that, Lord, you would just show me who that bush is. You know, maybe it's a person face-to-face. Maybe it's somebody that I'll listen to on TV or radio. Or, But, Lord, show me and reveal your purpose, your plan to me, just as you did to Moses. And, Lord, let me not be afraid of it being something that would be too intense or beyond my comfort zone. But Lord, let me go with a heart that is yielded, surrendered, and willing, and obedient. Because Lord, we want to taste of the good of the land. We want to be a part of your purpose and plan. That's our desire. That's our heart. So, Lord, for each person here this, this evening, let there be that, that little talk, that conversation with you. And may you, Lord, do that work of refining, molding, and shaping. For to you we give the honor, the glory, and the praise. And we ask these things now in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. We'll pick up with verse 11 next week.